Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Impact on Business and Tax Compliance. My name is Ashley, and I'm with Avalara, and I will be your host for today's webinar. So before we get started, I do have just a few housekeeping items to cover. A friendly reminder that Avalara cannot provide legal or tax advice, but we will answer your questions as best we can. On your screen is our safe harbor policy, so please take a moment to review that while I continue with some additional housekeeping items. We are recording today's webinar, so if you want to listen to it again or share it with a colleague, you'll receive the recording later today. The console you're looking at can be customized, so feel free to move or resize the windows. The additional resources section contains related resources, including today's slide deck. We do have a few ways for attendees to engage during today's call. So first of all, if you have any questions, you can submit those using the Q&A box. We will answer as many questions as we can throughout today's webcast, and we will also have some time at the end for Q&A. You can also use that ask a question box if you have any troubleshooting questions and I will try to help you out. Second, you can join our group chat and this is your way to chat with others. So the group chat is an option along the bottom. Click that, the chat box will pop up. So if you want to open that now and drop in where you're calling from, what the weather's like today, I'm calling in from the Midwest and it's supposed to be a high of 80 today. So it's feeling a little more like summer. And then third, you can engage with our reactions. This is new if you've attended our webinars before, something we added recently. You can click the little emoji smiley face and throughout the presentation, you can react with those and presenters can see them. So kind of a fun way to engage. I do want to call out that we are not 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 offering CPE credit for today's. We will have poll questions, but those are just a way to engage with our presenters, not to qualify for CPE credit. And lastly, if you have any technical issues, there is a question mark icon that you can go to for resources, or you can use that ask a question box that I mentioned. So let's meet today's presenters. First, we have Kate, the Director of Global Solutions Tax Technology Products at Avalara. Kate, can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Um, yes, absolutely. Thanks, Ashley. So I guess the relevant things on, on this slide here is that I have been in the tax technology field for more than 20 years. And throughout that entire time, I've been working with Oracle Financials as far back as release 10 for uh, character mode. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Next, we are joined by Tapo. He is the Vice President, ERP Applications Development at Oracle. Can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Ashley. Hi, I'm Tapo Day. I'm a part of the development team here at Oracle, joining in from Redwood Shows, California. And uh, just like Kate, I started my exposure to Oracle Financials in the 10-7 character mode days, right? And then it's been a journey since then. I've been with Oracle for a uh, little more than 25 years, and it's been a pleasure to not only design and develop the products with the most modern technology, but also to help our customers succeed. Glad to be here today. Thanks for being here. And lastly, we are joined by Kevin, Research Director of Financial Applications at IBS. Kevin, can you take a moment to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. I'm uh, Kevin Permenter. I'm a Research Director here at IBC. My main coverage area is financial applications, um, and that's everything from small business accounting through to the big ERP financial suites, and then into key point solution areas like accounts payable, corporate tax, Accounts receivable, treasury, and expense. We do market shares, forecasts, and market assessments in all of those areas. And uh, gives me a unique perspective. Um, and I'm excited, I'm excited to be here. This is a great topic, so it's going to be fun. Great. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks to all of our presenters for being here today. That is all I have for housekeeping. So I will pass it back over to Kevin to get us started. 
Like I, yeah, thank you so much. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this area is uh, highly dynamic. Financial applications, highly dynamic space. And I'm getting a little feedback. I'm not sure what that is. This area is a highly dynamic space. And one of the key places that's, that's seeing that change, seeing that dynamism, is the office of the CFO. That office, and I, I, I mean that is sort of everybody in the, the, you know, under the charge of the CFO, right? Um, so CFO at large. And that world is undergoing tremendous changes, one of which is now more than ever, they have to deal with more than just debits and credits, more than just financial data. Um, they're being asked to, in some ways, go from being a CFO to a CDO, Chief Data Officer. And what do I mean by that? Well, look, you know, now initiatives like diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of these things are landing in the, 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 the lap of the CFO. The CFO also has to participate in, in, in sort of a, a deep and meaningful way in uh, leading the charge when it comes to information technology, IT transformation. And then also, of course, talk to some CFOs that have consolidated all operations data, supply chain, hardware, inventory, sales, ops data. All of it goes to the office of the CFO. Going one step further, um, you, I've talked to some customers that are, and they've even said that their business relies on the office of the CFO to validate some of these streams of data. So in that case, a supplier, supply chain data isn't valid until it comes from the office of the CFO. You can imagine now that that puts over here in this call out box, puts an emphasis on creating platforms, again, with data management, data connectivity, data visibility at their core. Because again, CFO, is having to transition to CBO. <laughs> One of the other things that's happening inside of the office of the, or the CFO, or actually in broader financial applications, is this idea of convergence. Over the last two or three years, we have been tracking a growing trend. And you've seen it in the M&A activity. You've seen it in the organic and inorganic growth activity from some of these software vendors, bringing together these siloed areas like accounting and payments or AP and financing, AR and treasury, R and reporting, tax and accounting. All of these things are starting to, to come together. And what's really interesting about it is that this, uh, hey, venture capital bingo kind of thing happening off in the ivory tower somewhere. This is actually bubbling up from the line of business users that don't want to bounce between multiple applications, get things done. They'd rather be able to do as much as they can in a particular workflow. All of these like so, sort of key workflows, they'd like to be able to do as much of those workflows in one application. And what we've seen as well is that as we move forward, we've asked the questions, okay, so what kind of combinations would you like to see? More and more, we're starting to see if we have an accounts payable spending spend management solution, boy, we'd really like it to be paired with an expense solution or tax management solution handle compliance issues, tax management issues, and the like. Same thing uh, when you're talking about broader accounting applications. So you can see the stat here at the bottom. It's very indicative of what we've been seeing overall. And I got to say, more and more, we're as some of these initiatives that we'll be talking about later, like e-invoicing, some of the other uh, digital taxation issues start to develop, you're gonna see things like compliance, including tax management, tax automation, uh, audit, all of that, those aspects of compliance really take a you know, more forward seat. I've actually heard anecdotally that compliance has been you know, a big aspect of closing a deal for a lot of the software vendors. And that's that makes sense to me, again, with all of the regulatory issues, regulatory uncertainty that we're seeing. That takes me to my next slide, which is, boy, are we in the middle of a transformation when it comes to taxation. Uh, you know, I don't wanna go into all of these. Again, Kate and Topo will 
we'll dive into a lot of these in more detail. But I guess I want to impress upon you that all of these things, cross-border commerce and duty and customs issues that result from it, digital transactions, digital taxation, e-invoicing, the increased enforcement when it comes to tax authorities, all of it is happening now. And not only is it all happening right now, it's all happening differently in different countries, different regions, different markets, different vertical markets. And then on top of that, the only trajectory that we've seen from the last 10 years to now, and the only trajectory that we, we're anticipating from the, for this year to the next 10 years, is that these regulatory issues will just continue to increase. So it's, it's confusing now, it's complicated now, and it's only trending to be more complicated. Take e-invoicing, for example. You've got competing mandates happening in different countries. Different countries are taking a different spin on it, whether it's in Southern Europe, Northern Europe, EMEA, or Middle East and Africa, Southeast Asia, or South America. They're all sort of doing it slightly differently, enough to, to, to cause you a lot of issues if you don't have and this is what the, the, the real key comes down to. If you don't have the proper tools to, to manage this, this will be untenable. End of story. And it will just get worse <laughs> as we move forward. So what do those tools look like? What's the future of these financial applications? What does it look like? I do think there are four major sort of categories that they'll all sort of fit into be definitely a digital aspect. You'll see these financial applications like accounts payable, for example, uh, moving from checks and paper invoices to digital e-invoicing will, will, will take you know more forward leaning step there. Be converged, you'll see again in accounts payable, but also in some of these other areas, see convergences around certain key so the convergence that we've seen so far in the in the excuse me the convergence that we've seen so far has been around two areas money going out the door so sort of spend seen expense management solutions procurement solutions payroll corporate payment payment solutions all sort of coalescing in these really interesting ways and then we've seen it also on sort of the revenue management, money coming in the door. Seen it with some interesting combinations of billing systems, subscription management systems, treasury, of course, accounts receivable, reconciliation systems, reporting those systems, all in that effort to handle money coming in the door. We do continue to see those two as major convergence points. But then there's a third level of convergence where at the ERP level, you're starting to see all of these products and all of these uh, sort of solutions be built out under a larger sort of management dashboard layer that a lot of the latest latest ERP innovation is starting to provide. So big push around FP&A and insights, insights of solutions, insight management has been a big push. Again, it's all in line with this convergence issue. Of course, you'll see it being fully automated. We'll definitely see automation at the core level. Here's an example at invoice suggestion where we're going to see automation. You're going to see automation on the on the AR side, for example, when it comes to writing emails and corresponding with clients. On the tax side, you'll see automation when it comes to filing and 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 sort of gathering tax content, updating ca tax content. There'll be more and more automation for some of these core data management issues that you'll see when it comes to financial applications. And yeah, look, I do cover accounts payable, accounts receivable, tax, treasury, accounting, you name it, right? It's as broad as it comes. Every one of those markets, every one of those constituencies are anticipating massive change, massive transformation when it comes to intelligence. NML for sure will be part of, of these kinds of workflows, but then also 
we'll see Chin work its way in, large language models work their way into these uh, to these solutions and really sort of push the market forward in terms of what it can do. On the tech side, you'll definitely see that developing around some of the reporting characteristics that you have to do, some of the filing that you have to do. Again, it will be present on the Ian invoicing side as well. So yeah, every market I cover will be more intelligent going forward due to the, the rise of AI, ML, dealing with exploring and, and sort of trying to harness Gen AI as we go forward as well. So I hope I, my goal was, was to set the stage here for a broader discussion, dive into some of the key issues around uh, financial applications and, and where it collides with compliance, where it com collides with tax management, e-invoicing. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to throw it over to Kate. Kate, take us away. All right. Thanks, Kevin. So we're going to dive into e-invoicing, but I'll just give a, a quick overview about Avalara. So we are a global company. We have 22 offices across four continents. Uh, we've been in business since 2004. So we are celebrating our 20 year anniversary this year. We serve more than 30,000 customers globally and I think more than 75 countries, including one third of the Fortune 1000. We have a strong partnership with Oracle. We have more than 10 integrations across the Oracle suite of products. Today, actually, we'll talk a little bit about our solution with Oracle ERP Cloud Fusion. And all right, let's let's dive into e-invoicing. Oh, let's have a question before diving into e-invoicing. <laughs> Ashley. Yeah, I can take it away. Thanks, Kate. So we do have our first cool question. It is, are you a current Oracle user? Yes or no? You can take a moment to answer that and we'll look at the results in a second. I do just want to have a quick reminder that this webinar is not eligible for CPE credit. So this poll question is just for engagement and so the presenters can help tailor their message. So I will give you just a few more seconds to answer that. These are the results. So about 30, 60% split, 30, 70% split. So with that, I will pass it back over to Kate. Thanks, Ashley. Okay, so let's just start out with a quick definition of what an e-invoice is. Really two key points that I want to show you here. One is that a PDF sent via email uh, is not an electronic invoice. It's not an e-invoice. The definition really is you have to have structured machine readable data. So a PDF could accompany that uh, e-invoice, but it is not an e-invoice in it in itself. You need something that's in XML format or UBL, a universal business language. A little history lesson here. So e-invoicing itself is not new. As far back as the 70s, and there was kind of the, the starting, the first exchanges of, of invoice data. And this was a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, it did improve process efficiency, but it was complex to implement and maintain, incredibly expensive, really only available to very large corporations. And at this point, definitely nothing electronic was accepted by the tax authorities. Paper invoices were still required as the official documents. So I'm gonna move on to the 1990s, the late 1990s, and there's still the peer-to-peer the -peer exchange of invoice data, but what you're also seeing happening is sending those PDFs as email attachments. There was sort of improved accessibility to the peer-to-peer the -peer connections, but a lot of this still lacked automation. There were definitely some efficiencies gained on the seller side, uh, but the buyer side still needed to deal with manual. And I guess one of the other things to point out that happened in the 1990s is digital signatures started to be included in those those PDFs. 
Still, the tax authorities were not accepting any of that as your official documents. You did still have to have your paper invoices as backup. Okay, now we move into the 2000s, in the mid-2000s, there's um, adoption of more standard formats, such as UBL, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you're starting to see with this that you're getting efficiencies both on the buyer side as, as well as continuing on the, the seller side. And we're starting to see e-invoices accepted by tax authorities. Still, you need the paper and PDF as backup. And you're also starting to see governments mandating electronic, you can think about Brazil, really a pioneer there. So what we move into here is what Kevin mentioned earlier, that more and more countries are beginning to adopt this electronic invoicing as mandatory. Um, there's a paradigm shift that is happening now between accepted by tax authorities and mandated by tax authorities. So really what we're seeing here is it's not that e-invoicing is new, it is that the requirement to use the invoicing is new. Just kind of a, a simplified slide here of how does e-invoicing work. Processing the transactions, again, between the supplier and buyer, those are going electronically. So it's going directly into your systems, giving you those efficiency gains. The difference now is that the tax authority is involved and it, that can be done in a variety of, of different ways. And I'll, I'll step through those in a moment. Okay, here's kind of a quick overview of what we're seeing globally as how countries are adopting these mandates. They're sort of falling into, right now, I'd say about four different camps, and they're moving towards that, that last one, continuous transaction controls. So let's look at the first one here. This is referred to as the four-corner model, and it's kind of the, the simplest form of e at this point, this, this model does not include the tax authority directly. You're still going to be issuing returns, reporting to those tax authorities periodically, monthly or quarterly, um, whatever makes sense for your country. Um, there's two main programs here. One, it's much more common in Europe and a little bit in some other countries as well. And that's the PEPL format. So you may you may hear that word. The other one I want to call out here is Digital Business Network Alliance. This has become the standard for North America. And this was actually released and available at the beginning of this year. Okay, so then we move to the next level of complexity. And this is what's referred to as a model. We're still sending out from the supplier to the buyer, but those invoices also go to the service provider who is sending them to the tax authority. The tax authority is not involved up front, it's involved after that transaction has been sent. An example of a, a country who uses this model is Hungary. Next level of complexity is the clearance model. And here the tax authority is getting involved up front. That supplier is sending that invoice to the tax authority and the tax authority will respond back with some kind of approval. This could be an ID number, it could be a stamp, it could be a QR code, but the tax authority is reviewing that invoice data first and then allowing the supplier to send that to the buyer with that stamp or QR code or, or ID included and available. The next kind of level of complexity here referred to as a central issuance model. And at this point, the tax authority is actually involved in the middle. Not only does it approve that invoice and, and send back that acknowledgement to the supplier, but it also takes care of sending the invoice directly to your buyer via their service provider. Let's go ahead and do another question, Ashley. Yeah, I'm back with another question. So this is our second question. What is the size of your company? 
there are several options that you can pick from and hit submit. And just as a quick reminder, we are not offering to be credit for today's webinar. So this poll is just to engage and so we can help tailor the message to you better. So you can submit that when you have a second and I will pass it back over. Okay, thanks Ashley. So we kind of walked through the first four models that are in operation today and being adopted today. Um, and if you think about, especially those, those last two models, the tax authority is directly involved and they're directly involved up front. So that inherently comes with some risk if the tax authority system is down for some reason, actually stopping commerce <laughs> until they can get that back up again. So the go to more of a, a decentralized model, so continuous transaction controls. And here's where you have service providers also supporting the government. They'll be certified providers by the government. So it reduces the risk. There'll be multiple different providers involved. And the supplier can also send the information directly to the buyer. And the tax authority does get the information from all of those transactions. So, and this Kevin alluded to in his presentation that, you know, every country really is taking their own approach. And there are many countries coming out now and in the next few years with these mandates. This diagram really isn't to scale. If you look on the left-hand side, that's 20 years of, of adoption. And then we've broken down the last, last few years and looking at what's happening over the next five, six years. So again, as, as Kevin mentioned earlier, it's important to, to get ready now. Um, it, is, it is definitely a trend. Um, I don't think there's any stopping of this trend uh, that tax authorities are going to be mandating and expecting the, the electronic documents to be the source of truth for your invoice transactions. As governments are identifying and implementing these mandates, it can happen quickly. For example, Italy, it was just a few months after they announced the mandates that companies needed to comply. So a mandate can really occur at any at any time. The other thing that, you know, it makes it really important to get ready now is your paper invoices, your PDF invoices um, will become non-compliant. You have to utilize in order to do business in that country. So we've also estimated that in the next few years before 20, about 45% of the GDP in, in the EU alone will be covered by e-invoicing. And you can think about the primary drivers. Obviously the government has quite a bit of priorities here. What they're going after is reducing the, the VAT gap or the GST gap in their, in their country. Reducing their compliance control cost because everything is automated. And they also will get a lot of data about what's happening in, in the country. And if we look at this from a, a company perspective, it's not just that this is something you have to do to comply. We'll actually gain some efficiencies with having all of this transaction flow electronic. So you will see some cost reduction. There will be a faster payment cycle and you will see improvements in efficiency. And I really wanna point out that, yes, we are talking about invoicing, but a key part of an invoice is to have the correct tax result on that invoice. And it has to be immediate real time. Your invoices will be rejected if you don't have that correct result on them. So that's really sort of turning the compliance model on its head. It's not linear. It is now basically working with almost like micro reporting. Each of those invoices is uh, again, going directly to the tax authorities. The way that a tax authority will audit is changing because they do have all of this data. They can see the invoices supplier sent, they can see the buyer's information. And what they can start to do is utilize 
analytics, AI, machine learning to identify discrepancies, identify potential issues. It, you know, and they can it it allows for a different way to audit your business. Okay, so this this is the approach that, that Avalara is taking to provide support for your company to be compliant. If you look on the left side, I sort of refer to this diagram as, as the spaghetti. So traditionally, when you need to be compliant in a country with e-invoicing, you need to find a local service provider. It becomes an entire project, very specific to that country. You need to to know the local language in most cases. So as going through each of these countries, it's really working with separate project teams and it's really working with local serv service providers that you need to identify and develop a relationship with. What Avalara is doing is simplifying the work on the ERP side where you can send a base set of data um, over to Avalara and then we will look at what country, what mandate is this a business to business transaction? Is it a business to government transaction? We will translate it into the proper local country format, um, whether that be PEPL or in Italy, yes, Poland, the KSEF format, et cetera. So we take that burden off of you and that becomes more of a, a project, an initial project of gathering up that data. So as I mentioned, it is, it's an API based approach. You just need to send the data to our, our REST API um, and it allows you know, for faster deployment. So it is a, a single scalable, seamless global solution. And we do have that based on UBL. This is a little bit of the architecture of, of how we're doing this, as mentioned, from the ERP, it will come in via that REST API integration. Once we receive that in our ELR module, e-invoicing and live reporting, we will put that through what we call the Avalara Instruct that identifies exactly what that country needs. And it also identifies the workflow. So if, if this is a, a transaction that needs to go first to the tax authority, it will go first to the tax authority, gather up that stamp of approval or QR code, and then do the delivery. With Oracle ERP Cloud, sorry, Oracle Cloud or Fusion, as this might be known to at least about 30% of you in this in this webinar today. Um, we have actually automated working with Oracle provided collaboration messaging framework where we are a seated service provider and we we help have that the correct data gathered for you to send that through. So we're not just working with the REST API. We're doing a lot of that upfront work for you to make sure the right data is is going in. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Papo. Yeah, thanks, Kate. So let's jump right into the approach that we are taking at Oracle for the whole point that Kevin and Kate has been talking about. Uh, here's a quick safe harbor statement just to um, build upon Ashley's safe harbor around Avalara, because what we are talking about today, some of it is all available, some of it is going to be a little bit into the future, right? So. Given that around 30% of you are not yet using Oracle, so let me take a moment to just uh, give a little bit of a background on where Oracle fits in the overall financial management system and all the new industry trends that Kevin talked about. Oracle, as you know, is an infrastructure provider, a platform provider, as well as an application provider, which is a software as a service SaaS application, Kate mentioned Fusion and Cloud ERP, delivering the whole ERP suite as a service. So more than 10,000 customers across the globe. Most of the Fortune 100 customers are companies are our customers, which is something to be proud of. Literally billions of dollars of transactions going through our systems every day. Now that said, invoicing, as you know, 
is a fast changing space. That's what Kevin talked about and Kate talked about how as a service provider, they are handling that on a country by country basis, but at the same time standardizing and making sure that we are able to scale. So this kind of an approach dovetails very neatly into Oracle's strategy over here, where as a financial solution provider, as an ERP provider, we are within Oracle are experts on the credit to cash flow and the procure to pay flow. We handle the transactions within your organization the interaction or the movement of the invoice with or without the government agencies within the ecosystem is dependent on or is really accelerated by a service provider like Avalara. So from our perspective, we leverage e-invoicing for touchless credit to cash processing, for touchless procure to pay processing, but we need a provider like Avalara to make sure that we converge on a standard and do things in a scalable fashion. And that's exactly where we think that Avalara fits in. So let's expand a little bit more on that. So when we say that, okay, ERP is going to focus on credit to cash and procure to pay, and the partner or the service provider is going to help with e-invoicing, what exactly are we looking forward to from a partner engagement perspective? One part of it is the content validation, making sure, and, and Kate touched upon this, that it's very important that when we hand over an invoice for an outbound e-invoicing kind of a flow, that the software receiving it, in this case, Avalara, actually is able to validate and confirm that that's the exact piece of information that's needed for the onward transmission, both from a government compliance perspective, as well as on the other side, for the buying organization to receive the invoice so that they're able to pay. Similarly, when you're, when you're at the receiving end, when you're transmitting the information into the buyer's payable system, which is again, presumably Oracle or any other system, making sure that that has all the relevant pieces of information. The next part of it is about the connectivity. So when we are sending and receiving information, the actual handshake making sure that the messages, the acknowledgement, and all of those things come back in a seamless fashion, such that it is truly touchless, and your IT department or your business users don't have to go in and check on the validity of the messages and the acknowledgements and making sure that there are no, no uh, reports back from the tax authorities on any of the information that they have received. And that's another very important piece over there, and we'll talk about it a little bit on where Valera comes into the picture and the advantage. It becomes very, very important for the service provider to have the element of the tax. It touched upon it, which is essentially the compliance and interoperability part of it. Tax is one part of the compliance, the timely reporting, the micro level reporting that we touched upon earlier. All of those things are very, very important for the service provider. And that's where we come into the Avalara approach over here. The way we are building this is it's an embedded service within ERP. So the onboarding, so if you need to bring a service provider like Avalara, sometimes you end up spending months trying to integrate. You're getting that for free. It's an embedded service. So you onboard it almost as good as like clicking a button and making sure that you subscribe to Avalara service. So we want to make it that kind of a touch list. And then the big thing over here is the Avala, what we call the Avalara Advantage. It's a multi-country e-invoicing and international tax expertise in one source, right? So at the end of the day, as an Oracle customer, what you're getting is the powerful of the best be suite out there in the financials. But at the same time, you have these kind of added services, Avalara being an example, which are being embedded to really bring in the entire thing in a touchless fashion to you. So with that, actually, there's another question. So this question is, would you like to hear from an Avalara sales rep? So yes or no. So if you found today's presentation interesting or you have more questions, hit yes, and we will get someone to follow up with you and help with those questions or explore your options. So I will advance the slides, and I believe I'm passing it back over to Kate. 
That is correct. So thank, thank you, Tapo, for all that information, and thanks for the baton, Ashley. So let's let's jump in. As Tapo mentioned, we're very close line, we are a seated service provider to provide an embedded experience. So I'm just going to walk through a little bit with accounts receivable. The way that we have done this integration, the accounts receivable user, the billing uh, specialist, really their day-to-day -day work does not change. They don't have to go to new places. They don't have to do anything different than what they would normally do. So you'll see at the bottom of the screen here, it's a small snippet of the managed transaction screen in Oracle. When an invoice is first created, uh, for those of you familiar with Oracle, the transactions from order management, it can come through and be consumed by auto invoice and generate these invoices in accounts receivable. At this point, that invoice is not printed. And you will see there's no information in these fields right here, the delivery status, er any error messages in the delivery method. There is a, a job that is, is run. It's a scheduled process, process in Oracle itself that will run basically the invoice print on uh, an electronic format. So it's referred to as XML invoice processing. Um, when that job is kicked off, you can actually see delivery in progress in that managed transaction screen. As it has sent the data to Lara as the service provider, you will see that the delivery has succeeded. And once it has gone through and done the workflow process, um, reaching the tax authority and getting the response back, you will see that that transaction is accepted. If there happened to be an issue, you would also see a message right here of what that problem is. The invoice itself will be marked as incomplete, so you can do the correction and resend it. And I'm just going to just sort of sum up here that we have done a deep dive into e-invoicing today. We do actually, you know, solve for more than e with our compliance cloud. You can also have your, your VAT calculated, your sales tax calculated. Um, we, we do that determination. That information feeds directly into your e-invoice. And then we also have a VAT returns product that kind of rounds out that full Full cycle. Same thing in, in US and Canada, but we're really focusing here on, on the, uh, the countries outside of the US uh, for the, the VAT returns. And that, I think, oh, one more slide here. So if you are interested to take a look at the Oracle Marketplace and see our offering here. And the QR code will take you directly to that screen to get more information. And I think we're at the point to handle questions. And so I will pass the baton back to Ashley. Great. I'll change the camera view so we can all see each other for questions. Um, so thanks everyone that submitted a question so far. As a reminder, if you do have a question, we have that the question box on your screen. So you can go ahead and submit there. And we will dive in with these last 10 minutes. So our first question is, is there any deadline in place for the implementation of e-invoicing for US-based companies? And there's a little bit of an echo, so maybe to mute themselves and then come off mute if you have a response. Present. Okay, I can actually jump in here. Hopefully I'm not causing an echo. Uh, <laughs> it, there, There is not a specific mandate for the U.S., but the process is, is available so you can start to implement, utilize this network. And, and if you recall, it's using the four corner model. So the transactions are not directly being sent to the U.S. tax authorities. But you can definitely implement now. There is no official mandate where you have to implement in this manner. Thank you. All right. Next question. Is PEPL an independent body? Wait, that you know, holds... wait, before, you go, before you go forward, I want to yeah. add something. And I was on mute, so sorry about that. It's not a specific mandate right now, but... I think the folks at Avalero will, will also attest to this, especially here in the U.S. Mandate 
a lot of the, the driving force behind the mandate isn't actually coming from Congress or your State Department. It's actually coming from businesses. Many of them are multinationals that have to do it anyway, and they see some of the benefits. So I just wanted to make sure that that's, that's part of the discussion as well. Right now, there isn't a mandate here in the U.S., but a good chunk of the momentum is, is actually bubbling up from the specific companies, not necessarily, you know, Capitol Hill. Great. I'm going to hop around to a similar question, actually. We had a few people, more specific questions, and I'm going to generalize it into one. Um, so the question is, when a company is selling into multiple countries and some have an incoming e-invoice mandate and others like the U.S. don't, should they implement e-invoicing for every country they sell to? What are the benefits for that? Should they just do it as the mandates come up? Any thoughts on this? Well, yeah. I have some thoughts. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, uh, you want to go first? I'll, I'll, I'll let Kate jump in there and then I'll, I'll, I'll help out if I can. Okay. So it, it, the, this is something that actually you, your, your situation, what, what you're looking at is going to dictate it a bit. I will say that if you, as countries are coming out with new mandates, they are all slightly, slightly different. So mm -hmm. it may make sense to plan the rollouts for this information uh, as you go, as you are expanding into these countries, or, you know, if you already are doing business there, I, I would suggest working with the timelines that the governments are are coming out with. Having said that, if you look at sort of the standardized, the PEPL and A, it might make sense to kind of do those jointly. And then I'll also add in, if you are dating your ERP, maybe you are moving from another ERP to you know, Oracle Cloud ERP, Oracle Fusion, that's, you want to time this with the rollouts of, you know, as you're, you're creating rollouts for that implementation, you probably want to look at when, when are these mandates coming up and make sure you don't implement a country too late, if that, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Because if you, if you end up scheduling to implement a country six months after that mandate comes into play, you're going to have to cover that in your old legacy system as well as well as your your new system. Hopefully that, yeah, that covered it. Kevin, do you have additions? Oh yeah, go ahead. Top of it sounds like he has no, I was going to oh, I was going great. to just build up on the last point that Kate mentioned. Mm -hmm. Definitely when you're looking at an ERP and when you're migrating over to ERP, I mean especially if you're moving on to Oracle, I mean that whole our whole point is wherever there is a mandate, there is definitely an Oracle solution, probably through Avalara. And if there isn't a mandate or something that's coming up as well, there are partners available, the, um, the ISP kind of model that we talked about, where you will get the full support. So to Kevin's point, it's a very fast changing arc, uh, landscape. The the more visibility you have into that, the better off you are. So that, that would be a very important trigger point when you are updating your ERP to look into that space and see where you're going. Yeah, Kate Bowden knows uh, a million times more than I do about this topic. I mean, she's the <laughs> one to talk to about diving into the logistics of it. But here's what I can say. The visibility gained from being able to see your in real time stretches all the way from, of course, your, your AP teams or your AR teams all the way to the accounts, I mean, all the way through to the, the office of the CFO, right? The, to the actual CFO. Being able to have that visibility allows um, to, to be more accurate with the forecast, be more accurate with the cash management. Visibility is the name of the game. Visibility translates to agility, and agility is what you need in all this uncertainty. And all of that starts with being able to see your invoices at speed. So. You can wait if you want for you know a government to tell you to do that, or you can take advantage of the momentum that's already happening and get those get that visibility that you need. I think. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent point, Kevin. And it, 
you know, what, what's actually happening here with, with this transformation, just like the governments can start doing analytics, using AI, using machine learning to look at their aggregate, you get the opportunity to do the same thing for, for your company. And so, you know, it sort of ends up that the, the tax department, the tax director actually has all of this data and can share that out, can share that out to the office of the CFO. It also can be useful for other areas of the company, looking at the procure to pay flow, looking at the ordered cash flow, mm -hmm. all of that. It just, it, it kind of gives you a lot more visibility about what's going on. Thank you all. I think on hearing this presentation, a lot of people are thinking this sounds like quite the undertaking to implement. So a question from Victoria is related to what type of costs are companies seeing to implement these e-invoice mandates, both from you know, a monetary standpoint and a resource standpoint? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> it seems I always have thoughts. I don't know if Kevin or Tapo, you want to you want to jump in? Go ahead. No, go, go ahead, Kate. Okay. This definitely is a project. You do need to pay attention to where you store certain information, um, how clean your master data is. Do you have the right, like your VAT ID for your customers? How do you gather that information for your vendors? So that's that's an aspect of the project that could be um, a, a cost. I don't I don't have numbers for you. I'm really just looking at activities. But hopefully you can kind of ga gauge based on you know the activities that I've mentioned. So you know that can be cleaning up that master data depending on where you are at with your system. That may or may not be a large undertaking. The next thing to think about is you do need to look at okay you may have your data clean but where are are you storing it? Are you storing it in the the standard fields where Oracle Topo's organization has identified a lot of the data in the UBL, but you're going to have to make some overrides with it. Um, our Oracle integration definitely picks that up and gives you a tool. It might be, might be easiest to work work with an implementation team to you know who really understands how how to do that and that will happen for you very very quickly so you need to look at how many custom fields am I using right now? If everything is in the standard fields, that's going to be a really smooth implementation. If you've got some things in different places, if you have some, some quirks to how your processes work, then you're going to have an implementation cost to think about. I'm not sure what else what I want to point out there, but there definitely is a project involved when, when you do these. If you are moving to a new ERP, that project actually can sort of be full into, you know, typically these are country rollouts that happen when you're doing all of your processes. All of that testing that's required to do that um, can definitely be leveraged for this as well. So that can make the e-invoicing project much less expensive, much, much less of a usage of your resources to test and verify it because it's already planned. Okay, thank you for that. I think those are my points. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. We are at the top of the hour, so I just want to respect our presenters' time and the audience time. So I will just wrap up really quickly. You will receive a post-event email later today with a link back to this on-demand recording and the slide deck, um, and you'll be able to access all the additional resources if you weren't able to 